right, let's go. It's nine o'clock. I'm ruthless. <laughs> Are we up and going? Good morning, everybody, including those who are watching in cyberspace, those who are stuck in the traffic, and those who are having difficulty finding their way to the moot court. Those coming in at the back are welcome to join the happy throng. The more people, the merrier. We have a fully booked live audience of 55 people, and for reasons of COVID, we'd like to keep it that way. If you find yourself coughing and spluttering, we will supply you with a quick vaccination and a mask. I haven't heard anybody cough or splutter yet, so we should be all right on that front. As regards the virtual audience, I'm pleased to say that by last evening, 365 people have registered to attend in cyberspace. This is something that we got used to during the pandemic, and it is something that makes this kind of event far more penetrative than was the case both before and during COVID. So a, a special welcome to those who are attending in cyberspace. We started promptly at nine because we are mindful of the fact that you are sitting at home and you are not challenged with uh, getting to UCT on time and that sort of thing. We are going to try to stick to time as best we can. Just on the housekeeping front, and Chris will help me when I forget things on this, on this front. The first thing to do is to thank the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung and Primario for putting their hands in their pockets to make this event possible, and to thank UCT for making this um, venue, this wonderful venue, available to us free of charge. As regards the opening session, Minister Lamola has been called away to an urgent meeting in Pretoria. I wonder what they're discussing. And he will be participating in, in cyberspace. I think he will be, is, is he already on the line? Not yet. Okay, he may, he may be called away completely rather than just called away. But what we are going to do then um, when the logistics are sorted out is ask... Um, Gregor Jaker to welcome you on behalf of CAS and Professor Firoz Kichalia, who is the chair of the National Anti-Corruption Advisory Council to each take up about 10 minutes of our time in setting the scene for a conference which concentrates on the words of Oliver Tambo. That's why we're in the, the Tambo uh, moot court, we uh, hear him speak in 1993 of the need not to rest until freedom and peace reign in the land. That thought has been uh, modified or refined over, the, over time. What we talk about at Accountability Now is peace that is secure progress that is sustainable, and prosperity that is shared. P.S., 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 a postscript to the, the words of Oliver Tambo that you will find on the program of this event. From the sublime to the ridiculous, the men's toilet is as close to no nursery gorge as you can get without leaving this building. It is to the left out of, out of the front exit. And for the ladies is on the fire escape that leads down to the common room, which is one floor below, 25 stairs. And we will be having tea there at 11 and lunch there when the second panel, the whistleblowing panel, is finished. Um, please switch off your phones if you can or put them on silent if you can't. And the same applies to any other devices because you will spoil the fun of the 365-plus people who are with us in cyberspace. As regards the content of this uh, program, everybody has seen the brochure that came out. We, in, in, in eight words, we're implementing Glenister. We're protecting whistleblowers. We're introducing 
non-trial resolutions, and we, that's in corruption matters, obviously, and we are advancing the cause of the International Anti-Corruption Court. We think that these four topics are the cutting-edge topics, and uh, little remains for me to say at this stage other than to welcome Professor Kachar. Well, let's, let's start with, with a host. Gregor, you have your 10 minutes starting now. I wonder how I switch this on. Thank you, Paul. Good morning, Member of Parliament La Muller, Minister of Justice and Correctional Services, Minister of Parliament Breitenbach, Shadow Minister of Justice and Correctional Services, Professor Kachalia, Chairperson of the National Anti-Corruption Advisory Council, Archbishop Markoba of the Anglican Church, Justice Goldstone, former judge of the Const Constitutional Court of South Africa, Judge I Ian Farlam, former judge of the Supreme Court of Appeal, Professor Fikini, Chairperson of the Public Service Commission, distinguished speakers and guests here and online. Seldom has there been an opportunity to greet such a collection of eminent speakers and an eminent audience in one place. I welcome you to today's series of conversations in the name of the cooperation partners, the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, Primero International, Accountability Now, and the University of Cape Town. It is my honor to open today's proceedings on behalf of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, named after the first chancellor of Germany, Konrad Adenauer, in whose time the German constitution was written. Its implementation is a key reason for the so social recovery of Germany after the horrors inflicted during the Second World War. South Africa's constitution took much from it and carries exactly the same potential. The rule of law is directly linked to the health of a nation. Please allow me to say a few words about the Konrad Adenauer Foundation. As a think tank closely allied to the German CDU party of former Chancellor Angela Merkel, we promote democracy, good governance, human rights, and the rule of law through more than 100 offices worldwide. We foster dialogue between policymakers, actors from the private sector, and civil society. By bringing together people who embrace their societal responsibility, we promote the establishment of professional networks and the exchange of innovative ideas to tackle current challenges. Our work relies on strong local partners that share our values. I would like to therefore mention the excellent cooperation with our hosts, the University of Cape Town, in particular the DGRU, African Lee, and Laws that Africa, that sit in the Faculty of Law. In the last three years, they have developed with our support an app that makes the Constitution more accessible for members of Parliament, and that will be advertised to the legal fraternity and general public shortly. You can find it by googling Constitution Compass UCT. The app is available in English, Easy Cosa and Easy Zulu for the present and contains an updated and consolidated version of the South African Constitution, accompanied by guides and constitutional case summaries. These are written in a non-technical and non-partisan language by graduate law students and supervised by UCT law lecturers and professors. I cannot applaud UCT enough for its great work. I recently arrived in South Africa from previous assignments in Kenya, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and Iraq. Each of these have revealed different faces of corruption and the dangers of weak criminal justice administrations. And while I'm a supporter of federalism, in Kenya, I saw how a devolution program led to the dispersion of corruption from the political center to many counties due, elect, due to a lack of anti-corruption measures. While I'm a supporter of the market economy and international trade, 
in DRC, I experienced how a country blessed by God with endless riches of mineral resources, nevertheless, is one of the poorest societies with high infant mortality due to corrupt political elites colluding with international companies. And finally, while I'm a supporter of international development cooperation for reconstruction, in Iraq I saw how reconstruction and the unleashing of large amount of investment led to an orgy of corruption due to a lack of a functioning justice system. To cut a long story short, corruption is an international sickness that eats our future and therefore eats our children. Without a functioning criminal justice system, the fundamental characteristic of corruption is escalation, both horizontally through the public and private sector and vertically from the very top of society to the very bottom. And mu much like mineral resources attract international investment, societies with weak criminal justice systems attract international specialists in corruption. Political oligarchs and corruption enablers that will steal one's country. And this is not abstract, it is personal. One may live one's own life with integrity but a failure to fight corru corruption actively will bring violence such as assassination and kidnapping into one's own life. It is not something that can be appeased and patient does not contain it. And given these reflections, I would like to say on behalf of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation that we welcome today's event as an opportunity for South Africa to develop its own solution to corruption that light the way for the international community. It would not be the first time, given the miracle of South Africa's peaceful transition from apartheid. It is now a society that honors inherent human dignity, human rights, and seeks the achievement of equality through checks and balances on the exercise of power. I look very much forward to today's conversations and thank you very much for your time. Th thank you very much, Gregor, and my apologies for my inability to silence my laptop. It sits at home and nobody complains when it makes a noise there. I'm pleased to say that Minister Lamola is... Um, uh, please, Mr. Moderator, come in and take a seat. <laughs> there he comes from the back. How's your team on the front, uh, Judge? They, they, they're ready and briefed and waiting for you. Thank you. Um, Minister Lamola is standing by in cyberspace, I think, or shortly will be. But in the meantime, let me call, and we must thank Crispin Peary for all of the hard work that he's done in order to get the minister, uh, if not in the room, at least with us in cyberspace. I think that the uh, time is best used by asking, calling upon Professor Kachalia. I don't know how far away he is. That's the trouble. He's, uh, he's on. He is on. Thanks. Right. Thank you. Over to you, Professor. Is it unmuted? Yeah. Seems that the minister would like to go first, so let's un unmute him and uh, allow him to join. Um, minister, wel welcome to our conference. The, um, the line is unmuted and everybody is waiting expectantly to hear your input of 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can hear me uh, clearly. All uh, distinguished guests uh, at a conference, 
leaders of uh, civil society, academia, uh, the legal profession, and uh, religious um, and faith group organizations, and all uh, conference um, attendees. It is um, a great pleasure to participate in this um, conference and um, at this uh, time in our country. A gathering of this nature is indicative of the fact that there is general consensus that corruption cannot be addressed by government alone or any type of services to the people of South Africa. Civil society, the private sector, and academia as a collective the government can be instrumental in effecting <clears throat> service delivery and fighting corruption in our country. As we gather here today, we are giving effect to the phrase democracy in action. We may not necessarily agree on certain aspects, but I do think that uh, it is crucially important for us to look at the challenges we face from various uh, perspectives. As government, we are now in a position to act on the recommendations of the Judicial uh, Commission into the allegations of state capture, corruption, and fraud in the public sector. I am pleased to highlight a few areas where significant progress has been made to date. And this obviously will lead to ongoing debates in society um, and to the shape of our democracy and of our various institutions. The National Prosecuting Authority and the investigative directories have made significant progress in their renewal program. The reinstatement of the Aspirant Prosecutors Program has seen the reinvigoration of the NPA countrywide and more than 1,000 new employees have been brought into the fold over the past three years through the aspirant uh, prosecutor program that has been reinstated to recapacitate and recalibrate the National Prosecuting Authority. One of the weak points which have been identified in the criminal justice system is a silo approach in the fight against fraud and corruption and crime in general. Today, we see greater levels of collaborations and coordination between the Investigative Directorate, the RC Forfeiture Unit, the Special Commercial Crime Unit within the, uh, the, the Special Investigating Unit and the Directorate for Priority Crime Investigation. This has been self-evident with the ACTT records recording 35 cases in court involving 180 accused. In total, the Investigative Directorate has enrolled in two cases involving 187 accused individuals have appeared in court for alleged state capture related offenses. This is not something to be scoffed off as it is proof that accountability is beginning to take shape. It might have taken time, but gradually these institutions are beginning to yield results. This is the same work that has led to the recovery of 12.5 billion rands into the fiscus. Furthermore, the impact of the performance of law enforcement agencies can be felt in all areas of our democracy. When law enforcement agencies fail to perform, we are judged as a country by international financial institutions, such as rating agencies, the Financial Action Task Force, and, and so on. Capacitation of these entities, including the NPA, has received the much needed injection of funds to assist in achieving their mandate. The impact of grey listing by FATF, which we are soon to receive the final outcomes, will have a dire effect on our economy and the ability to raise funds in the international markets. This is where coordination and collaboration is needed to work together to strengthen the criminal justice cluster and with the economic cluster as well. And work is underway. We are awaiting the outcomes and we remain ready to attend to the issues raised and to address some of them, as we have already done in the amendment of some of the legislations that were identified. To ensure that the independence and security of tenure of the incumbents in the investigative directorate is strengthened, is strengthened we've, we are in a process of drafting a new bill which is currently undergoing internal consultative processes between relevant departments and stakeholders 
and um, hopefully it will also invigorate a debate on this matter. This work builds on President Ramaphosa's pronouncement in October as part of the actions we will undertake to implement the recommendations in the Judicial Commission's report. In the interim, while the consultative process are underway, we have assigned peace officers' powers to the investigative directorate. This will enable them to arrest people, take statements, conduct search and seizure operations in line with the Criminal Justice, with the Criminal Procedure Act. Let me pause here to say that we are aware of the views that this structure has to be a Chapter 9 institution for us to meet the standards set out in the, in the Glenista judgment. At the heart of this argument is the notion that in securing the independence of the MPA and its subsidiaries, its interface with government poses a danger to its autonomy and its independence. This is where we differ with the proponents of this view. Because paragraph 58 of the Glenista II judgment is instructive and it reads, for our country to win the war against these serious crimes, we need to enhance the capacity of the police to prevent, combat, and investigate these crimes and other national priority crimes, those codes. At paragraph 80, the same judgment supplement this view by invoking international law. It says in international law, does not support the proposition advanced by the applicant either. For example, the legislative guide for the implementation of the United Nations Conventions Against Corruptions provide, and I quote, state parties may either establish an entirely new independent body or designate an existing body or department within an existing organization. In some cases, an anti-corruption body may be necessary to start combating corruption with fresh and concentrated energy. In other cases, it is often useful to enlarge the competency of an existing body to specifically include anti-corruption. Corruption is often combined with economic offenses or organized criminal activities. It is thus a sub-specialization of police, prosecution, judicial, and other, for example, administrative bodies. Implementers are reminded that the creation of a new bodies with hyper specialization may be counterproductive if it leads to overlapping of competencies and need for additional coordination, etc. That will be hard to resolve. Close, close quote. Perhaps the most pointed rejection of this argument is found in paragraph 124 of the Glenista judgment, which reads, the independence of any anti-corruption unit in the context of international agreements must not be confused with the independence of the judiciary, for example. Nor does independence in the context of anti-corruption international agreements require that the executive should play no part in the functioning of anti-corruption agencies. Where this is to be the case, this will run afoul of the fundamental principles of our legal system as contained in our constitution, in particular section 2, 106, um, 1 and 179, 6. Indeed, it is doubtful whether if that had been the requirement, states like ours will have ratified these conventions. What is crucial, therefore, is whether the anti-corruption agency enjoys an adequate level of structural and operational autonomy, secured through institutional and other legal mechanisms aimed at preventing undue influence, close quote. While it is true that chapter nine of our constitution is where independent entities are, ho are housed in our democracy, we are of the view that the independence of an entity like the NPA and any subsidiaries cannot be looked through a simplistic lens of where the entity is housed. Is housed. Its independence must be assessed via the lens of structural and operational autonomy. This was identified by the Lister judgment and then again by the Judicial Commission on State Capture. Some of these reforms have begun to take shape. The clearest example is the manner in which the current National Director of Public Prosecution was appointed. We had a transparent selection process and we will proceed um, to have engagement and continue to solicit views from society, including a forum of um, this nature on the work that is ongoing in this regard. I would also like 
to speak on the issue of um, whistleblowers in our country. I would like to pay tribute to all the whistleblowers who have come forward to reveal the underbill of unethical conduct and corruption in the public and the private sector. They are the true embodiment of a famous saying by British philosopher John Stuart and Mill, when he said, bad men need nothing more to compass their ends than the good men to look on and do nothing. Close quote. You are the good people who refuse to look on and do nothing. In many cases, this has come at great cost to their families and to themselves personally. The level of reprisal which whistleblowers are being subjected to is proving to be counterintuitive to the laudable goals of whistleblowing, which are in the main to mainstream integrity and exposure and, ethic and expose unethical organizational cultures through detection and protection. Whistleblowing is an integral part of any anti-corruption framework. Quite clearly, in our context, there appears to be a gap in, in the overall intention of what the Public Disclosure Act seeks to do. One of the gaps we have identified is the fact that companies or government departments who are implicated by whistleblowers are not held accountable for victimizing whistleblowers. The second gap we have identified is how we can transition whistleblowers into the witnesses in the criminal cases where possible. In direct response to the recommendation by the Judicial Commission of Inquiry, comparative research is being done on the, on the incentivization of whistleblowers. And we are hopeful that we will be able to release our discussion documents to close the gap and the loopholes and to reform the regime for whistleblowers in our country. The review of South, Af South Africa's anti-corruption architecture discussion documents, which highlight the, the mandates of the various entities engaged in the fight against corruption, compares this with comparative international bank march, benchmarks, points to an outdated uh, whistleblower protection regime. Consideration is also being given to the creation and modalities of the anti-corruption entity. This work will be the culmination of research and discussion that has been ongoing for the past two years. Distinguished guests, these are some of the reforms that we are currently seized with, and we will hopefully release these documents that I have alluded to for greater public inputs and participation to reshape these institutions that we believe should withstand any political or private or any other type of capture but should only be guaranteed by the constitution, legislation, and the rule of law in our country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your participation, Minister. We appreciate your time, and we understand that you have urgent affairs of state to attend to in Pretoria, so we wish you well in your endeavors later in the day. It will be possible to, to catch up with what happens here on YouTube because all of the proceedings, including your speech, are, are being recorded in cyberspace. Thank you very much. All right, you can. Thank you. Uh, I've been, I've been advised that the, the director general of the department uh, has joined physically there. That, that, they that, may be able to. Engage that's very good news. Yes. Forum. <laughs> he owns up. He, he's confessed to being present. He is here. He signed the the register. We can prove it. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank, thank you. Thank you, Minister. I now call on Professor Kachalia, into whose time uh, a little bite has been taken by the Minister. Professor. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, and um, uh, let me say all our protocol observed. Um, I haven't got a full list of the eminent uh, people who are here, and so I prefer not to take the risk of <coughs> an under-inclusion. Um, but I am happy to be here um, to engage with all of you. Uh, so many of you are uh, playing important roles um, in... furthering our fight against corruption. Um, I thought I might 
be of assistance to to this forum best by sharing with you some very um, preliminary reflections um, in the NACAC, which as you all know has been established to advise the president. Um, we have not yet uh, finalized uh, our views on a very important question which, uh, which this conference is engaged with and on which we have some um, interesting views, I think, uh, for, for consideration um, about the institutional infrastructure of an anti-corruption agenda and particularly on this question of a new anti-corruption agency. Um, you have the um, Glenister judgment uh, the recommendations of the Zondo Commission and the anti-corruption strategy adopted by Cabinet all envisage the establishment of a new agency. Uh, and the Minister has shared his reflections on, on, the, on, on the views of the uh, Department of Justice on this matter. Um, I want to share with you our very initial thoughts. Uh, recently, when we had our first stakeholder engagement, we, we had the privilege of listening to uh, Professor Stone, who identified five traps for any country considering the establishment of, of new institutions in the fight against corruption. And I want to share with you our understanding of what an all government and an all society approach, uh, which is our mandate, might bring to this debate. Now, there are two traps which he mentioned. The first is to overemphasize in the fight against corruption, issues of behavior as opposed to structure. This is what he said on this matter. When a government is afflicted by corruption, we tend to put the blame on people for 80% and structure for 20%, but we probably got the proportions reversed. What we in South Africa see in South Africa is that changing people and policies is not enough to rescue a government from entrenched corruption. More attention should be paid to making structural changes and most important to building a culture of professional excellence in government. So bear this in mind when I share with you our reflections on what we think the new agency should look like. And the second that he mentioned is to think that Establishing a single agency is a panacea, and what he proposed is a multi-agency approach because he made the point that a single agency might itself be vulnerable to capture. Now, <coughs> it seems to us, and I say this on a very preliminary basis, that the debate in South Africa has been, is dominated by a criminal justice perpetrator-centered, legalistic conception of corruption, which, which points to the importance of focusing on resourcing the independence and so forth of the various institutions that make up the criminal justice system. And we can all agree that that is important uh, fundamental, and we've heard the minister share his reflections about um, about what needs to be done to comply with Glenister uh, to strengthen the uh, investigation and prosecution of what we can call criminal corruption. The role of 
NECAC, the council that I now chair, is to provide advice on the strengthening um, of the institutions of the criminal justice system and compliance with, with uh, the requirements of the Constitution as set out in Glenister. And we haven't yet had an opportunity to do that. I want to distinguish this narrow conception is important and essential of corruption as, as being equivalent to criminal corruption and a broader conception which we think should inform, also inform how we think about the um, institutional infrastructure of a long-term anti-corruption agenda. I'm going to call that, for the time being, systemic corruption, as distinguished from in the, a, a conception of corruption which focuses on behavior, on individual criminal acts. <clears throat> this perspective, that is the broader perspective, recognizes that corruption may be embedded in democratic institutions and in the administration of public services and may include conduct that is not always illegal but nevertheless inconsistent with the standards demanded in public life in a constitutional democracy. And therefore, the anti-corruption measures should include structural reform the strengthening of existing institutions, and you've heard what the minister thinks about what, what should be done, but also establishing new institutions, including ones that can implement preventative measures, as well as to focus on behavioral change in an all society approach. You can see how I think we've got a paradigm issue here. If you're focusing only on the institutions of the criminal justice system, then you're not focusing on an all-society, all-government approach. Um, so these are our kind of very preliminary thoughts. Uh, let's say I'm sharing them with you as the chairperson of NACAC at a very preliminary stage uh, in, our, in our thinking. The Constitutional Court the Zonda Commission and the NACAC recommend establishing new anti-corruption institutions without clarifying the structure, powers, mandate, and location. But we all agree that the current institutional structure falls short. Our work stream on this topic is working on a proposed model for consideration by the presidency. We haven't finalized that model. So my remarks should be understood with those qualifications. My view is that the new anti-corruption institution that is established should be independent of the executive branch, focus on systemic corruption, prevention, and should have all the necessary powers and resources for this purpose and when I presented these preliminary ideas at our stakeholder forum, there's some, there was some debate about the extent of its powers, about whether those powers should include typical law enforcement powers like entry and, uh, and seizure. Uh, but it certainly should have auditing capabilities, forensic auditing capabilities, big data analytics, and so forth. Think about the problem we have in Tembisa Hospital. How does a paradigm which only deals with individual criminal acts retrospectively after the fact assist us? It assists us because we need accountability for criminal acts. But we also need, I think, as part of our institutional infrastructure, the ability to act proactively to deal with systemic corruption. The agency that I'm suggesting here should have such powers would be able to go into an institution uh, like um, the Tembisa Hospital, where there is evidence, say, through whistleblowing or through a complaint system, which should be in put in place in, in such an institution, where there's sufficient evidence um, to, to initiate uh, a, a forensic audit. Um, and if, if there is evidence, for instance, as the Zondo Commission has done, to refer evidence of criminal conduct to the relevant agencies for investigation, prosecution, and so forth. 
we think possibly that the mandate of this new institution should include whistleblower protection, procurement fraud, uh, public complaints, uh, monitoring and evaluation, uh, and public engagements. Uh, because we, we need to mobilize our society. We need to involve the whole of society in this fight against corruption. I'm almost done. The new body should probably not include. So there, there is ample uh, opportunity for engagement with the Department of Justice. The new body should not include, this is our preliminary view, the agencies of law enforcement, like the NPA, the Hawks, the South African Police Service, in other words, those concerned with the investigation, prosecution, punishment of individual acts of criminality, like criminal corruption, fraud, bribery, and so forth. Uh, but it could refer matters for investigation and prosecution, as did the Zondo Commission, and collaborate with other anti-corruption agencies like the Public Protector, the FIC, SARS, the AG, the PSC, as well as those institutions that compose the Hawks, the NPA, SAPs, and so forth. And those institutions in the criminal justice cluster, the debate there should be about further resourcing, about capacitation, and about independence. The Department of Justice is, is proposing some possibilities, but it will be, you will now appreciate that the institution we are proposing which does not incorporate these law enforcement agencies is quite a different animal. And in our study of, 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 in, of, of such bodies elsewhere, there are examples of bodies which include the law enforcement agencies and others which don't. Um, and we should have that debate. It is inappropriate, possibly, to locate bodies with strong confidentiality requirements and those which are subject to ministerial direction, like the South African Police Service, in a new anti-corruption agency, which is constitutionally required to be independent of the government. So there, that's, that's an important question. Whether when we talk about establishing new anti-corruption agency, we think that all these uh, various components of the criminal justice system should be located in this body. The same body which has the responsibility to engage with society, receive public complaints, deal with systemic corruption proactively, and so forth. We also think that the proliferation of new agencies with overlapping mandates should be avoided. The Zondo Commission, for instance, recommends a new agency on, on public procurement. Um, we're not sure uh, if, if that uh, proposal was fully thought through, but it may be better to think, uh, uh, to avoid this problem of over-proliferation over and overlapping mandates. Um, and that the new proposed agency should be understood as being part of a national anti-corruption and integrity system, which in fact should include the Department of Education. Think about the role of the Department of Education needs to play in the fight against corruption. But if you focused only on the criminal justice system, then you lose sight of the role of, of the whole fabric of government institutions, as well as the possibilities of involving uh, stakeholders, civil society, and the broader community in the fight. I would say finally that we think that the establishment of this agency is an absolute urgency and imperative. The Australians have just uh, in, uh, passed legislation to establish a new agency. I think it took them 10 years. We don't have 10 years. We want to have, we want to, we think we should establish an agency which has such uh, important powers to deal with uh, uh, systemic corruption yesterday. And, and so um, doing the necessary work, the research, doing the financial modeling, drafting of the legislation, and so forth, 
should be structured in such a way that we can get to an outcome as soon as possible, and that is going to depend on a consensus emerging. And I hope we can engage with, with uh, people like Paul, um, the two Pauls, um, and others who have played such an important role in this discussion to see that, that perhaps what we're offering is, is a way of engaging with the Department of Justice. This does not involve any uh, involvement in, in, in matters which are within the domain of the Department of Justice. It doesn't involve us strategically in any uh, of the complications concerned with, uh, with the various uh, ministries in the Department of Justice. So if, if we can reach this kind of consensus through stakeholder engagement on the kind of institution, agency, independent anti-corruption agency that we have in mind to deal with systemic corruption, then there are no impediments, really, to, to establishing this institution on, a, on an expedited uh, basis. As I said, the, these, the, these are views that are under considerations in our council, but, but have not been finalized, and we look forward to, to the debate, because the debate is required to help us kind of finalize our model. After all, it is part of our mandate to engage with society, to engage with yourselves, uh, in formulating our advice to the president. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. At this point, we are going to circulate in an anti-clockwise direction. I will ask the panel, the first panel, to come up this way and everybody on the top shelf to go out that way. Um, Nicola Talyat and Chris Andres from the sponsors, Nicola from Primaria and Chris from CAS can come and sit next to me if they wish or hide in the back if they don't and the new panel can take its place. While we are politely waiting uh, to seat. <laughs> yeah. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I think we're in, in for a s stimulating series of debates, particularly on the four topics that are to be dealt with by the panels. Um, I think we should all express our gratitude to the minister for the amount of time and trouble that he's taken, not only the fact he, he was here in a virtual way, but in, in relation to the work that's clearly been done in prepar preparing his address. address. There are a number of interesting points that he raised. Some of them will, I'm sure, be greeted with enthusiasm and approval. There are other matters, however, which I think in the course of the day we will have things to add to what he has to say and indeed possibly correct some of the comments made. But still, it was very interesting to hear what he had to say and I, I enjoyed it very much. I must confess, as a moderator, I have to restrain myself. Moderators don't take part in the debates. They're like referees, you know, referees I'm not supposed to score goals, not that I necessarily would score a goal even if I tried. But um, I will resist the temptation to deal with some of the points he made. I just want to say one thing, and that is the, uh, the first topic, as you can see, is um, deals with what we're going to deal, deal with in next in this, in this panel. But what are the legal requirements for anti-corruption machinery of state achieving compliance with Glen Glenister? And that is really the first question I would think, th think that has to be considered in a debate such as the one that we're engaged in. And we all, particularly when we deal with 
compliance with Kenister, we have to deal with a point which the minister, as far as I could hear, didn't deal with, and which is at the center of the debate that we're going to have. And that is the finding by the Constitutional Court of this five standards that apply to, to adequate, that should apply legally in South Africa to, for, for adequate anti-corruption machinery. The STIRS uh, requisites, I take it all of you know about them. Um, th those of you who would like to refresh your memories, you will find the book that we were given as a present a reward for coming, uh, Paul Hoffman's book, Countering the Corrupt, de deals with the matter very fully, and of course it'll be dealt with very fully also in the speeches that are going to be made. But STIRS, the, the last S, in, you know, STIRS, S-T-I-R-S, those are the five requisites. The last requisite, the second S, is the very important one, which up to now has been overlooked to a very large extent. When the um, National Public Prosecutor uh, made a report to Parliament, she spoke about the new legislation, she spoke about the lessons that have been learnt. Well, one lesson that appears not to have been learnt was the, the lesson contained in the second S, which of course is security of tenure. And that's something that we will be, be looking at, I would, ima would imagine, um, very carefully. Because if we don't comply with the last S, we may well find ourselves wasting our time. And, you know, a nation that forgets its history is obliged to relive it. We've gone through that already once. We had the Scorpions, which I think complied with the STI, R. They didn't comply with the last S. And that was a very costly lesson that we had. There was talk earlier about having to have a debate that could be 10 years, we haven't got 10 years. The answer to that is, of course, we've had the 10 years, and look what happened to them. That lesson was, I won't say learnt, but it was there to be learnt. But that's a matter that our speakers will deal with. Um, the, I don't have to give you the curricula vitae of our speakers, because they're, they're on the document that you have. I, I'm, I'm simply explain how what's going to happen. The f our first speaker is going to be Paul Pretorius, and he is going to deal with Glenister II, the second decision of the Glenister series. He will be f followed by Isaac Smuts, who will deal with Glenister III, where uh, I suspect uh, Isaac may indicate that we may have wandered a wee bit off the, off the path of, of rectitude, but uh, something that he will help guide us back onto. And then finally, we will have Lawson Naidu, and he will explain to us and uh, give his views and approach to the way forward, what we must do and how we how we going to set about ensuring that the uh, the machinery that we devise and bring it, bring into operation is indeed adequate for the purpose and complies with our international obligations and our constitutional um, requirements. So, without further ado, I call upon Paul Pretorius to deliver his address. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Is this working? My job is to explain Glenister II. Uh, it's a technical and complex judgment or set of judgments. And uh, in the interests of clarity and given time constraints, uh, I will concentrate on the issue of independence, but uh, also perhaps venture briefly into other areas as well. I might just mention in response to the minister's address, the honorable minister's address, that paragraph 5880 and 124, which he uh, quoted, um, come from the minority judgment. It's that same judgment um, which at paragraph 113 reads, in the result I conclude that there is no constitutional obligation to establish an independent anti-corruption unit as contended by the applicant and the amicus. It follows, therefore, that the argument based on a constitutional obligation to establish an independent anti-corruption unit must fail. I will deal with the majority judgment in due course. In essence, at, at a structural level, what Glenister II was concerned with was the abolition or disbanding of the DSO or the Scorpions, and in its place, the creation of the DPCI or the Hawks. But importantly, 
the DSO Scorpions were taken out of the National Prosecuting Authority and placed into the South African Police Services. And this affected the accountability lines and the uh, structure of the organization significantly, and it is that um, that uh, was analyzed at some length in both judgments. So Glenister challenged the laws that brought about these two changes, the abolition, uh, the establishment, the abolition of Scorpion's establishment of Hawks, and the movement of that body from NPA into the South African Police Services. Importantly, the duty dealt with was not only to establish the structure, but to maintain it. And that's an important qualification uh, of uh, the duty. And if I may remark, while independence is a principle, its true value lies obviously in effectiveness, which must surely be the primary goal, uh, an elusive goal. Importantly, in terms of the Constitution, Paris 19 and 64, the NPA must institute criminal proceedings, and the South African Police Services must prevent, combat, and investigate crime. So there's a bifurcation of the task uh, of uh, fighting corruption, and uh, for me personally, given the experience of the Zondo Commission, it's fundamental. Uh, the minority judgment said, and I've already given the answer, one of the issues to be considered was, does the Constitution require Parliament to establish an independent anti-corruption unit? And if so, did Parliament comply? The minority judgment answered that question in the negative. The majority judgment answered it in the positive, at least the first part. Essential to the minority judgment, and this goes to the bifurcation issue, for our purposes at least, is a finding that it is untenable, I quote, untenable to suggest that without the power to investigate crimes that it prosecutes, the NPA cannot act without fear, favor, or prejudice. It's not a fundamental finding. That finding institutionally has been tweaked with in the 11 years, 12 years since Glenister, but I'm dealing with the time at Glenister. It's important to understand that. The lesson of the Zondo Commission is clear. Investigation, the development of investigation strategies and prosecution are intertwined. And we now have a hindsight advantage to show that. So the finding in paragraph 78 of the minority judgment that it is indeed doubtful whether the power to investigate crime can be said to be incidental to the power to prosecute crime must be called uh, into question and is called into question, has been uh, since. And I'll deal with um, the lesson of Zondo certainly as uh, uh, I have uh, seen it um, in due course. Section 7.2 of the Constitution, the state has a positive duty under 7.2 to prevent and combat corruption and organized crime. That was a finding of the minority judgment. But fundamental finding of the majority judgment, there is no, const uh, sorry, the minority judgment, <coughs> there is no constitutional obligation to establish an independent anti-corruption unit. Requirements of independence quoted in the minority judgment of the OECD the power to initiate own investigations, that is fundamental. Those decisions as part of an anti-corruption strategy ought to reside in an independent body, a body independent of the executive, and certainly as far as the Hawks is, are concerned, do not. Allow investigators and prosecutors autonomous decision-making powers in handling cases, not to be subject to undue influence from any branch of government or third party, have structural and operational autonomy. And obviously, transparent procedures for appointment and removal of directors and accountability. It's instructive that the NDPP, the National Director of Public Prosecution, should enjoy 
10 years, uh, security of 10 years. Not one to date has managed to reach the 10 years. The majority judgment was qualified. It said not full independence was required, but an adequate level of structural and operational autonomy. Of course, those are categories that must only be defined and clarified in practice. Uh, the true inquiry uh, should be, I venture to suggest, what should the structure comprise of in order to be effective? The provisions of the South African Police Service Act were then analyzed in some detail, and it was concluded that within that act there were sufficient safeguards uh, to protect uh, a sufficient degree of independence on the part of the Hawks as they existed then, that's the DPCI. Fundamental, and I'll come to this at the moment, was the role of the ministerial committee. The ministerial committee is fundamental in the structure of the SAPS Act, and what it says is that it is the ministerial committee that must in effect strategize, create policy, and it has the power to establish priority crimes. That's where the think tank is, the think tank that deals uh, with what the Zondo Commission tried to achieve. The majority judgment, and if I must be frank, which we must be because we're dealing with such an important issue. We must be frank anyway, but the, we now know that that ministerial committee failed dismally in its strategy task over certainly the state capture years. And the question is, is it doing its duty now? Because that duty remains. The majority judgment agreed with the minority on a number of issues. The legislation establishing the DPCI was not irrational. Public involvement was sufficiently involved in the creation of the legal framework. The Constitution doesn't oblige the specialized corruption fighting unit to be contained within the NPA, but there must be one. The creation of the DPCI, the Hawks in the South African Police Service, was not in itself unconstitutional. And the abolition of the DSO and the creation of the DPCI was not unconstitutional. Two questions remain for the majority. Is there an obligation on the state to establish and maintain an independent body to combat corruption and organized crime? I stress establish and maintain. Yes was the answer. If so, does the law creating the DPCI, the Hawks, meet the requirement of independence? The answer was a clear no. The legislation was therefore declared unconstitutionally invalid and the order was suspended for uh, a period of 18 months. The finding, there is however no doubt that the scheme of the constitution and legislation as a whole imposes a pressing duty on the state to set up a concrete and effective mechanism to prevent and root out corruption and cognate corruption practices. The quote de dealing with independence highlights five issues. Free from undue political interference, genuine political will, that is a requirement of effectiveness, and that's important. A comprehensive anti-corruption strategy, that is also important. And the question to be asked in all the legislation, the Constitution, and in, with the proliferation of crime-fighting structures that we have at the moment, where is that think tank? And that is crucial, and I'll illustrate why if I have a moment. Structural and operational autonomy, clear legal basis, and mandate. Um, that duty is in intrinsic to the Constitution, and it's constitutionally enforceable. So the minority is wrong. Our constitution does, does require the state to create an independent anti-corruption entity. And our law demands a body outside executive control to deal effectively with corruption. The DPCI therefore lacked the necessary independence as required by domestic law, uh, informed by international law and the constitution. 
I want to deal with the ministerial committee because I must focus. The quote is, our gravest disquiet. That was uh, the judgment's precise words. For a ministerial committee to determine policy guidelines for the functioning of the Hawks, the DPCI, which was what existed at the time on its own, and for the selection of national priority offences was a fundamental transgression of the requirement of uh, independence. The judgment found that the DPCI was subordinated to executive control. Importantly, and we know this from hindsight, ministers oversee an anti-corruption entity where of necessity they are themselves part of the operational field within which it is supposed to function. To quote again, hands-on management, hands-on supervision, and hands-on interference. And the, that the majority found impossible to square with the requirement of independence. And with hindsight, we know that over the last 10 years, if not now too, the ministerial committee and parliament clearly failed in their duties uh, as set out in the SAPS, South African Police Services Act. So for these reasons, concluded the majority, the statutory structure creating the DPCI offends the constitutional obligation resting on Parliament to create an independent anti-corruption entity, which is both intrinsic to the Constitution itself and which Parliament assumed when it approved. Five minutes. Okay. All right, I'm watching a clock in front of me ticking down. Um, yeah, you will know when you have 10 seconds to challenge a decision, I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> um, I just want to digress for a moment. Um, what the, the fundamental question asked by the Zondo Commission is, are we dealing with isolated and ad hoc acts of corruption or is there something more? And what the Zondo Commission was able to do quite successfully, despite all its criticisms, despite all the faults, what it was able to do was establish patterns, relationships. It was, it was able to look where uh, crime was being protected, not prosecuted. Um, and that really was its uh, great contribution. It, it conducted money flows. It investigated thoroughly at a very broad and high level in order to find out what was going on in the ground and therein lied its effectiveness to develop a detailed investigative strategy and prosecuting strategy. What is required in anti-corruption, therefore, the Zondo Commission illustrated, is a high-level, highly skilled investigative think tank Something like the Ministerial Committee, uh, which obviously is not an ideal locus for such an obligation. I just want to read a list of issues that face us today. And I'll, I'll do so without comment. Sabotage at Eskom, sabotage at Transnet, theft or robbery in the coal supply chain, bus transport mafia, construction criminality mafia, University of Fort Hare assassination, innumerable political assassinations, particularly at a municipal level, Tembisa hospital assassination, mining mafia, including the Zamazamas, stripping of infrastructure, July unrest, where are the ringleaders? Um, continuing procurement corruption, Combined by a narrative of attacks uh, on the Constitution and judiciary by senior uh, politicians. The question must again be asked, are these random ad hoc acts of criminality or are there organizational links between them? Are they or some of them part of an organized project? Is there a recognizable aim or motive that is access to the vast financial resources of the state. Why is it so that there have been relatively few arrests and prosecutions? 
Diakoran assassination, July unrest, Fort Hare assassination, Eskom sabotage. And I'm talking about the people high up, not those people necessarily on the ground. These orders come from somewhere. Where is the money flowing? Are there connections and protection within the political establishment? The role of public service politicians, elective representatives, and facilitating and profiting from this, is there being investigated? Are these questions being asked? By whom and where? That is a fundamental issue uh, to deal with in fighting corruption and in implementing Glenister II. Thank you. Uh, shorter than you need it to be. Um, your, 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 your laundry list of questions was answered by Ghalema Matlantle in uh, 2007, and what he said is on the last page of the program, just above the, the, the hand with the Sturz criteria. Um, I think Smuts is next, and yes, he's sir. got 18 minutes, but you, you're in charge. Yes, all right. <coughs> oh, I, I needed one piece of... If anybody's got questions, write them down on a piece of paper like we did at FW last Thursday and move them to that end of the, of, of the room and we will then sort, arrange and put questions at, uh, at the end of this panel. I Thanks. I understand the questions which you ha hand in will be gone through by Paul and his assistants. They will prepare a short list of the mo most important questions which I will then put on your behalf to, to the speakers. There's a f famous... A uh, lawyer in America who uh, was very short in the argument. On one occasion, uh, and the Chief Justice was very strict to the Supreme Court of the United States. But he, he ended triumphantly and said, I have five minutes left and I donate them to the court. Well, the minute, minute, that, minute that was left, uh, was, there was no donation, but it was gra grabbed by Paul and said, so We benefited from what he had to say. <laughs> we now move on to a more controversial decision, I think, than Glenister II. One which has been criticised, and it is not uh, uh, bulletproof, and I'm sure we will hear things from Isaac Smuts, which re reflect at least on s the unsoundness of part of the judgment. But I call on Isaac Smuts to tell us about Glenister Three. Thank you. Is that the school board? Your, your 18 minutes begins now. Thank you. I shan't require them. Yeah, I bear the battle scars of Glenister III, um, but one may legitimately inquire, having heard from Paul how the requirements of an appropriate anti-corruption establishment were defined in the majority judgment in Glenister II, why we need a conference of this nature at all. Uh, the judgment of the majority in Glenister II is a work of art. We who earn our livings in the courts seldom have sufficient time to read judgments to assess the poetry, the linguistic symmetry, or the analysis of a judgment in sufficient detail. This judgment is worth reading for just those purposes. It examines the objectives of a constitution designed to promote and protect a developing democracy. It examines and underlines the relevant constitutional principles of application to the inquiry uh, and it underlines the relevant um, requirements placing our democracy amongst the family of nations that have committed themselves to the global fight against corruption, highlighting also our international obligations in the field. It's quite frankly a thing of beauty. But moving on to its message, the solution one might think is plain. Line up these requirements put the structure into operation and nail the blighters, if only it were that easy. In the light of the findings in Glenister II, amending legislation was adopted, purportedly to meet the requirements of the majority judgment in that matter. Neither Bob Glenister nor the Helen Sisman Foundation were satisfied that the amendments met the requirements of the majority and the issues returned to court. A major contributor to the fact that we are still having this debate nearly 12 years after the majority judgment in Glenister II was delivered was the confusion which was occasioned by the majority judgment 
in the follow-up proceedings in which Paul Hoffman's Dale Carnegie trained team of activists called politely Glenister Three, and in what I couldn't help but think of as Mahweng's revenge. The former G Chief Justice was a member of the minority in Glenister Two, but penned the majority judgment in Glenister Three. The confusion was exacerbated by the fact that the two co-authors of the majority judgment in Glenister Two, Mosineke DCJ and Cameron J, could not agree in Glenister Three on what they had jointly determined in Glenister Two. And for us lesser abled minds, the challenge was quite considerable. I propose to examine what emerged in Glenister III with particular reference to the case advanced by Bob Glenister himself, as opposed to that presented on behalf of the Hill and Sussman Foundation, which focused on specific aspects of the amending legislation. And then to see what remains of the findings in Glenister II, which Paul has summarized. Glenister's case in the Constitutional Court differed in approach from that of the Helen Sisman Foundation, uh, which focused on specific provisions in the legislation, uh, to focusing quite specifically on uh, arguments that the required degree of independence for the walks had not been attained uh, in the amending legislation. And while Glenister himself contested the constitutionality of various provisions in the amending legislation, he went further in focusing um, on the entire scheme of the amending legislation, arguing that it was fatally flawed. Critically, he contended, it failed on the crucial issue of independence. Unsurprisingly, he looked to the language employed in the majority judgment in Glenister II to determine whether the amending legislation met the specified standards, the STIRS requirements, and particularly that of independence. And there were three elements of the judgment that stood out in such an examination. The first was this, and I quote, the creation of a separate corruption fighting unit within the South African Police Service, SAPS, was not, and I stress, in itself unconstitutional. And thus the DPCI legislation cannot be invalidated on that ground alone. And Glenister contended that the phrases in itself and on that ground alone should be read to have meaning. And we presented that argument with some conviction. The second element was this. Now plainly, and I quote again, now plainly there are many ways in which the state can fulfill its duty to take positive measures to respect, protect, promote, and fulfill the rights in the Bill of Rights. This court will not be prescriptive as to what measures the state takes, as long as they fall within the range of possible conduct that a reasonable decision maker in the circumstances may adopt. A range of possible measures is therefore open to the state, all of which will accord with the duty the Constitution imposes, and I stress again, so long as the measures taken are reasonable. Again, Glenister contended that the words in the circumstances and so long as the measures taken are reasonable uh, were meaningful and should be so interpreted. And we who presented that case were all persuaded that O'Regan J had illustrated the position definitively in her judgment in the matter of Rail Commuters Action Group and others versus Transnet, limited trading as Metro Rail where she set out in another thing of beauty, the considerations as follows. What constitutes reasonable measures will depend on the circumstances of each case. Factors that would, would ordinarily be relevant would include the nature of the duty, the social and economic context in which it arises, the range of factors that are relevant to the performance of the duty, the extent to which the duty is closely related to the core activities of the duty bearer, the closer they are, the greater the obligation on the duty bearer, and the extent of any threat to fundamental rights should the duty not be met, as well as the intensity of any harm that may result. The more grave is the threat to fundamental rights, the greater is the responsibility on the duty bearer. Thus, an obligation to take measures to discourage pickpocketing may not be as intense as an obligation to take measures 
to provide protection against serious threats to life and limb. The third consideration in Glenister 2 was this, and I quote again, this court has indicated that the appearance or perception of independence plays an important role in evaluating whether independence in fact exists. This was said in connection with the appointment procedures and security of tenure of magistrates. By applying this criteria, criterion, we do not mean to impose on Parliament the obligation to create an agency with a measure of independence appropriate to the judiciary, the phrase that, that Paul quoted. We say merely that public confidence in mechanisms that are designed to secure independence is indispensable. Whether a reasonably informed and reasonable member of the public will have confidence in an, in an, in an entity's autonomy protecting features is important to determining whether it has the requisite degree of independence. Hence, if Parliament fails to create an institution that appears from the reasonable standpoint of the public to be independent, it has failed to meet one of the objective benchmarks for its independence. This is because public confidence that an institution is independent is a component of or is constitutive of its independence. And on that point too, uh, Bob Glenister contended that public confidence in the independence uh, was not established and was lacking in the Amendment Act. On that basis, he then approached the application in the matter that became H HSF against the President and Glenister III. He set out to illustrate that the scheme did not fall within the range of possible conduct that a reasonable decision maker could adopt in the circumstances and that accordingly Parliament had not adopted reasonable measures required by Glenister II to respect, pr protect, promote and fulfil the rights in the Bill of Rights. And he referred to a host of incidents and events that it evidenced corruption and by reference to expert testimony premised upon evidence of corruption and public perception thereof, he advanced his attack on the Amendment Act. The interesting point is that the respondents who opposed the application had chosen not to res respond to the evidence and a substantial body of it there was that Glenister advanced. It simply requested the High Court to strike it out and the High Court duly obliged. That formed part of Glenister's appeal to the Constitutional Court. Early in the Concord hearings, there were indications in questioning from the bench that at least an element of the bench saw the judgment in Glenister II quite differently from the way in which Glenister himself had interpreted it. And the difference in interpretation of what the express terms of the judgment meant was starkly illustrated in a comparison of the judgment of the majority in Glenister III, penned by Mahueng CJ, and a minority judgment written by Furnaman J, with which uh, Cameron J agreed and with a substantial element of which there was further agreement from other members of, of the bench, but nevertheless a minority. The majority judgment said the following. Uh, I, I confess that I do not see this as a thing of beauty. The allegations in the struck out material amount to reckless and odious political posturing or generalizations which should find no accommodation or space in a proper court process. The objective appears to be to scandalize and use the court to spread political propaganda that projects uh, that projects others as irredeemable crooks who will inevitably actualize Mr. Clem Hunter's alleged projection that South Africa may well become a fa failed state. It, the majority struck out that evidence, including the expert evidence. With that, it struck out his attack on the fact that the Hawks had been located in, within the police service. What was struck out uh, included evidence from highly regarded academic sources, an affidavit and report from Professor Gavin Woods of the Anti-Corruption Education and Research Centre at Stellenbosch University, and an affidavit of Mr. Gareth Newman, the head of the Crime and Justice Programme uh, 
at the Institute for Security Studies describing it as odious political posturing. Much of that evidence read now appears to be a first draft of what eventually appeared as the Zondo Commission report. As an aside, one wonders whether the current Chief Justice, who was a member of the majority, still holds the view that it was odious political posturing. Pranaman Jay in the minority judgment said this, the main judgment finds that Glenister II foreclosed both the constitutional challenge that Mr. Glenister sought to bring against the SAPS Amendment Act, as well as the evidence that he sought to adduce to sustain that challenge. I disagree. Glenister II does neither. If that decision needs to be revisited, it must be done appropriately with reasoned discussion and justification for any change. It should not be done by reinterpretation of its meaning that narrows its original scope without explaining the necessity for change. With reference to the manner in which Glenister II had dealt with the constitutional obligation to establish an anti-corruption authority, Furnaman Jay recorded the following, quote, the judgment does not state that the creation of a separate corruption fighting unit within the SAPS will withstand any constitutional attack. It says that something else will be needed in order to sustain that kind of constitutional change. Mr. Glenister sought to show that the additional factor was that the current extent of corruption in our body politic was of the kind that showed that the location of the DPCI within SAPS was not a possible option for a reasonable decision maker. In other words, he contended that this evidence showed that locating the DPCI within SAPS meant that it could not have, quote, sufficient attributes of independence to fulfill the function of it required under the Constitution. It's the uninitiated reader may be excused for wondering how two interpretations of the same judgment could be so diametrically opposed, particularly when it is considered that the majority judgment in Glenister II was penned by Mosineke DCJ and Cameron J, uh, with whom Fruen among J, amongst others, concurred, while Mosineke DCJ concurred with the majority judgment in Glenister III, and Cameron J concurred with Fruen among J's majority judgment. One is reminded of the uh, celebrated phrase from Alice in Wonderland, when I use a word, it means exactly what I intended to mean, nothing more and nothing less. So what did survive after the majority in Glenister III? It's not unfair to suggest that the essential requirements spelt out in Glenister II did survive, although somewhat hollowed out. The majority in Glenister III certainly lowered the bar for an acceptable level of independence. For example, even where the Western Cape High Court had um, declared Section 17CA of the Amendment Act unconstitutional, uh, this determined the process for the appointment of the national head of the di Directorate for Priority Crime Investigation, consolidating the power to appoint the head in the minister and the cabinet, which one might not think free of executive uh, interference. The majority judgment found the section to be constitutionally compliant. It was no surprise when shortly after this judgment was delivered, the head of the DPCI, Anwar Dramat, was suspended from office and uh, resigned rather than going through the process envisaged from him. But certain other limitations were struck down, uh, regulations providing for ministerial interference were struck out, and interestingly where the Majority judgment in Glenister II had said the, the uh, Constitutional Court did not want to be prescriptive. The majority in Glenister III, in fact, legislated and excised um, and severed elements of the amending legislation. So the essential requirements of an independent anti-corruption institution accordingly remain as part of our law. And what is critical is the element referred to by Paul Pretorius, which is a genuine, genuine political will to make it work. The other requirements of security of tenure, adequate training, specialization, and the provision of resources are still there on paper. The challenge facing South Africa is the fact that these requirements have not nearly been met 
since spelled out in Glenister 2 nearly 12 years previously. And Glenister 3 sounds a warning that we shall have to be on guard to ensure that the requirements are given real content rather than remaining fine sounding concepts. And if we can persuade the minister's advisors to read beyond the minority judgment in Glenister 2 and go as far as the majority judgment, that may be of some assistance in the package that the department is seeking to address. But I pose the question, how many more Zondra commissions will be required before we take these requirements seriously? And to use cricketing parlance, it's your innings. Thank, <coughs> Thank you, Isaac, a very thoughtful and insightful presentation. Um, <coughs> now it's my duty to call upon Lawson Naidu to address us on the path ahead. Thank you. Um, so, sorry to interrupt you, Lawson. I need to speak to my friends in cyberspace because the chat room in cyberspace is open and anybody in cyberspace who wants to uh, participate in uh, questions and answers is free to do so by uh, putting their questions into the chat room. And um, I don't see too many pieces of paper flying around in this room, but that's perhaps because the presentations are so overwhelming. I've got two pieces of paper so far, oh, but uh, I'm sign. prepared to accept, accept four. But, but, but before we get to deal with the pieces of paper, Lawson Naidu first must take us down the path ahead. Uh, thank you, and uh, thank you to Paul and Isaac for for dealing with the uh, the legal issues emanating from the, the those two uh, Glenister judgments. Uh, what I'm going to try and uh, sketch out for you is what's happened in uh, in practice uh, from 2011 until where we where we find ourselves today. Uh, and I want to start by making reference to uh, a research report that CASAC published in March of 2011. Uh, it, in fact, it was launched uh, literally a week before uh, the judgment in Glenister II uh, was delivered. And that was a piece of work aimed at looking at the constitutional and legal uh, legislative landscape in South Africa and what were the gaps that existed in terms of creating an effective anti-corruption machinery. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the title of that paper was uh, Combating Corruption towards a comprehensive societal response. Resonates very strongly with uh, the issue which I'll come to in a moment and which Feroz has touched on already, uh, the National Anti-Corruption Strategy, which was adopted in 2020, which speaks similarly of a whole of society response uh, to combating corruption. Um, shortly after that, we, you will recall that we had the National Development Plan uh, so it gets, sometimes gets mentioned by politicians in speeches. Uh, but that national development plan, um, in its final iteration, uh, supported the multi-agency approach towards combating corruption. Interestingly, the draft of the NDP had uh, supported the single agency model, which is what was uh, uh, espoused in that CASAC document of March 2011. Um, so we then had the Hawks, and you've heard the critique um, of, of the judgments and uh, implicitly of the ineffectiveness of the Hawks over the past decade or, or so. Uh, and I think what, what then happened was at some point, and I think it was around 2013, 2014, um, the, uh, the uh, so-called anti-corruption task force, the ACTT, came into being. And that was a recognition that there needed to be greater coordination amongst these different law enforcement agencies in order to effectively combat corruption. Now that's been a, an informal structure and remains so to this day, even though it is still in existence and uh, arguably a lot more effective today than it was uh, at its inception um, eight or nine years ago. And that's largely to do with the issue which Paul has, has highlighted and I think is is the most critical issue when, when dealing with the uh, of, um, aspects of combating corruption is, is there the political will to do so? Because various studies have shown that you can design whatever system you like, if there is no political will, it will not succeed. It's as simple as that. And 
uh, together going hand in hand with political will is, is all of the, the STIRS criteria uh, and, and specifically the issues of resourcing. Um, what we, we, we then have um, uh, a series of recommendations that have come out of the, um, the, the Zondo Commission reports. And there are three uh, structural recommendations that uh, the Chief Justice makes in his reports. Um, we've ref uh, referred to some of them already. One is that the Commission of Inquiry should become a standing Commission of Inquiry, uh, a permanent uh, inquiry into state capture that is established and I think quite controversially proposes that that standing uh, commission should be able to exercise oversight over parliament. Now parliament is a democratically elected body and I'm not quite sure um, whether on the issue of the separation of powers but certainly on the issue of the autonomy of parliament to have a, a, a non-elected body uh, exercising oversight over Parliament. Now we know there are myriad failings of Parliament that are highlighted in the Zondo reports, but I don't think that that's necessarily uh, an appropriate way to deal with Parliament's failings in that regard. The Zondo Commission has also recommended that an agency be established for the protection of whistleblowers, uh, and then thirdly that there should be uh, uh, another agency that deals with uh, procurement issues and combating uh, corruption in the procurement space. So three different uh, uh, agencies that are proposed in the Zondo uh, reports. Um, and then we have um, the NACAC. Uh, and as uh, uh, Professor Kachalia has pointed out, the uh, National Anti-Corruption Strategy was, um, was endorsed by, by Cabinet in November of 2020. Uh, the National Anti-Corruption Advisory Council was um, established in the middle of last year um, um, as one of the recommendations that emanates from that uh, anti-corruption strategy. And uh, I don't want to repeat um, what Firo said earlier, but I'll, I, I will come back to, to, to some of what he's, he said, because I think it needs to be uh, emphasized in the context of this discussion. I think it raises critical issues that we need to engage in taking into consideration the sort of legal background of um, where the two Glenister cases in particular leave us. Um, and then we've got, uh, you know, the, the proposal with the, which the Minister of Justice referred to and, uh, 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 the ch you know, the proposal for the establishment of a Chapter 9 institution or an integrity commission uh, uh, to, deal with, to deal with corruption. And, uh, you know, I think uh, with references made to the, the STIRS criteria uh, from the Glenister II judgment, which, which I think we would all support and, and buy into. But, but if I might, I, I might want to add an, an, uh, an extra vowel to the STIRS category, because I think there's an A missing in there, and that is the issue of accountability. Uh, there's an, a lot of emphasis on the independence of any anti-corruption agency, but it must equally be effectively accountable, um, uh, and I think that's something that we need to place some emphasis on. And I think in, in some of the discussions uh, that CASAC um, has espoused is that the issue of, of, of accountability needs to be placed high on that agenda, and the role of parliament as the accounting body needs to be clearly defined. Um, I think over and above, uh, and there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of focus around uh, one aspect of combating corruption, which is the investigation and prosecution element of it. But it's a much broader uh, uh, issue, as, as again, as Feroz raised earlier, that uh, he spoke about the narrow conception of corruption and the broader one. And I think there are two other elements of an anti-corruption strategy that m cannot and must not be neglected, and that is, uh, uh, steps taken to prevent corruption, uh, whether at a systemic level, at a, a uh, organizational level, at an ethical level, at a departmental level, uh, and then critically the issue of public awareness around corruption and what can be done to combat it. This is something that has largely been left to uh, the civil society sector to deal with 
um, because very little attention is, is, is given to it by, by the state. Um, and it's certainly uh, a, an investigating and prosecutorial uh, body such as the DSO or the Hawks or even the NPA is not best suited to uh, carrying out uh, that mandate. So I think um, it, it brings me really to the issue of, of, of where, where do we go to from here. We've also heard that uh, you know, the president has, is on record as saying that he wants to, uh, having established the investigating directorate in the NPA, now wants to create that as a permanent structure. So we've got these, all these uh, proposals uh, um, uh, you know, floating around at the moment, and I think it's going to be the task of the NACAC uh, to, to come up with a, with a set of proposals that, that create some clarity about where we need to go and how to, uh, um, to combine what Ferro spoke about earlier as the, uh, the narrow and the broader conceptions of, of corruption. So on the issue of the investigating and, uh, and prosecutorial side, I think we, we're seeing again, um, and this is without... Uh, wanting to sound like I'm yearning for the a return of the, the scorpions. But a, 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 a prosecutorial-led investigative process, I think, has proven to be very, very successful, not just in South Africa, but globally. Um, so I think that's something that uh, a reconfiguration of the law enforcement agencies, uh, that's an approach that will need to be adopted. Uh, and, uh, you know, whether there's... Um, how that actually plays out um, will have to be defined, but uh, it's certainly something I think that, uh, uh, that, that needs to be done. And again, Feroz has made reference to a whole range of other, other uh, agencies in that anti-corruption space, you know, the SAPs, the Hawks, the SIU, the AFU, um, uh, you know, the, the, the list goes on and on, including uh, the Chapter 9 institutions of the Public Protector and the Auditor General. And there needs to be some rationalization and ensuring that there is no overlap of mandates um, uh, within that space. But I'm, I'm certainly uh, being, um, being won over to the argument that Feroz is putting forward that the, the agency that the NACAC might want to establish is really going to deal with the, the, the latter two issues of looking at systemic corruption and, and preventative measures in that regard, as well as public awareness. But I think the one issue that, that remains um, for us to perhaps ponder and, and think about is what is the relationship between that agency and the investigation and prosecutorial body? Where, where, what are the links there? Uh, uh, because if the agency, as Feroz has articulated, is going to receive complaints from the public, what does it then do with them? Does it conduct a sort of initial scan or... Uh, uh, a high-level review of the complaint and then refer it to the uh, uh, to the, uh, the law enforcement agencies to prosecute, and if so, <clears throat> what then is the reporting mechanism back to the agency that has referred the complaint? So I think those are some of th those uh, are some of the issues that we we still need to uh, to address. And I know these are issues that are on the agenda of the NACAC, but I think a, a gathering such as this. Um, is, is really important in, in helping um, to crystallize some of those issues and to provide possible solutions to them. Um, I think, uh, you know, again, uh, the other issues that we need to focus on in, in, in this discussion is about the location of that agency. Um, you know, it's, it, it's got to be independent outside of, of executive control or authority, but where precisely does it sit? Um, I have some sympathy for the minister's uh, view that a, a Chapter 9 a, uh, entity may not be appropriate. And uh, before Paul jumps on my back, I'm going to say that uh, we've seen uh, also how Chapter 9 agencies can be captured. So that's not a panacea for, uh, uh, for what we're looking at. And I think we need to really focus on, 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 on the detail of the, of the institution and, and its reporting mechanism to ensure that it is uh, effectively independent, um, as I've said. So le perhaps let me uh, give you five minutes back, Paul, and end there. Thank you. Th thank you, Lawson, for the five minutes back, and uh, let's let's go straight on to the Q and A. Yes, I have be been handed um, two, three questions for the moment. 
um, which I shall put to the panel. Um, the first one is uh, addressed to advocates Pretorius and Smuts. Is it legally possible to apply directly for the court to seek proper implementation of the STIRS criteria? Is it legally possible to apply directly to the court to seek proper implementation of the STIRS criteria? <coughs> criteria? Paul, would you like to start by uh, All right. answering? Um, uh, anything to be added? Can be just for provided? information, the STIRS criteria to stop corruption are specialized, trained, independent, resourced, and secure. The Constitutional Court will not um, dictate an interpretation uh, unless it forms part of a legitimate uh, suit before it. Um, it will judge any decision Parliament makes in applying any criteria that it deems applicable. Uh, against the requirements of the Constitution and its prior judgments. Um, now, that's a, a generalized uh, answer, but it's important to understand, especially um, for non-lawyers, the position of uh, the Constitutional Court. The Constitutional Court will not dictate the form and structure, nor the activities uh, or even policies of uh, any structures uh, that these are created. But it will, after the event, judge whether what has been done by Parliament meets the requirements of the Constitution and law. So Glenister too says, more specifically, we emphasize that the form and structure of the entity in question lie within the reasonable power of the state provided only that whatever form and structure are chosen do indeed endow the entity in its operation with sufficient independence. So the Constitutional Court will look at what is done by Parliament and it will pass judgment on that. It won't, before the event, give clarity on qualifications uh, set out, for example, in the Sturz criteria. Is there anything you want to add? Yes, I mean, it, it would be offensive to our separation of powers doctrine if we had the uh, Constitutional Court legislating. That's not its role. It's entitled to, te to test legislation. The interesting thing about Glenister III was when the Constitutional Court did intervene regarding the Amendment Act, it granted or it ordered that certain elements of the um, Amendment Act should be struck out or severed without any of the parties having asked for it. Thank you. Um, the next question is for Lawson. Um, is the um, final responsibility of the Minister of Justice over the NPA consonant with the independence of the NPA? Uh, thanks for, uh, to whoever asked that question, yeah. Uh, it's a critical one, and I think um, I think that needs to be uh, uh, seriously reviewed. Um, there is no agreement on what that means in terms of what the final responsibility of the minister is. Uh, we'll know that we know, and we'll recall that it was used as a pretext for uh, a previous minister of justice to seek to interfere with the national director of public prosecutions, which led to his suspension and ultimate removal from office. So I think it is inconsistent with the, the notion of the uh, National Prosecuting Authority exercising it fu its functions without fear, favor, or prejudice. Uh, and I think uh, it was certainly a recommendation from the uh, Jinwala report into uh, the suspension of Vusi Piccoli that that uh, aspect of the Constitution be reviewed. Thank you. Um, all right, the, the, I've been, been handed two questions which cover, more or less cover the same ground. Um, I'll read them both. <clears throat> Given that the NPA has serious functionality problems and will, have, and will have them for many years, is an independent and new corruption investigation and prosecuting body not a necessity for combating uh, corruption? Perhaps you could, uh, I don't know which of the three panelists wishes to, to deal with that, but. Um, 
No, no, I'd like to say something about that. I can see uh, that from the twinkle in your eye. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I mean, I think we know, and certainly we know from the from the reports of the Zondo Commission, if we didn't know previously, uh, the impact of state capture on hollowing out state institutions, and the NPA was not only not immune from that, was probably one of the, the prime targets of that state capture um, um, a process. Um, but I think we must gi also give the MPA the, the credit that it does deserve. I mean, there have been serious attempts to try and turn it around. Uh, the minister made reference in his speech earlier about the um, resuscitation of the aspirant uh, prosecutors program, the recruitment drive that's taking, uh, uh, taking place within the NPA, uh, the minister's own uh, role in terms of making sure that additional resources are being mobilized for the uh, NPA. Uh, and yes, it's going to take a long time to, to fix uh, and get the NPA back to the kind of uh, uh, body that we, we require in South Africa. Uh, there is a, a huge capacity shortage there still, and they're looking at creative mechanisms of bringing in external capacity to, to meet those demands. Um, but I think that the, the question really is, you know, do we, if, if we set up another agency, where are we, where are we going to get the skills from? Because if they're not available for the NPA, they're not going to be available anywhere else. So, uh, you know, I, I, I don't, d don't see that as a viable uh, option, and I would rather uh, say let's focus on fixing the NPA. It's a critical institution uh, in our democracy within the, uh, uh, not just in terms of fighting corruption, but in terms of fighting crime generally. So uh, I would certainly s suggest that we, we lend our support to making sure that the NPA becomes the the organization that the Constitution envisages. Thank you very much. I'm Thanks. informed by our uh, sponsors, <coughs> uh, the accountability now, in the form of Paul Hoffman, that uh, we run out of time. I had some very interesting questions before me, which uh, would have led to uh, a very interesting debate, or rather further interesting debate, following on the one we've had before. But that's something that those who asked the questions may wish to put to the panelists privately during the break which we're now taking. It's a, uh, how long may is May I just comment on, on something that, that uh, Lawson has just said, though? Yes, I, I don't agree with the proposition that if, if skills and resources are not available to the NPA, they're not going to be available to anyone else. Um, I referred, and with reference to the, to the Glenister uh, II judgment, um, to the family of nations in which we operate. And there are enormous international skills available, which I would contend are not only uh, available in the countries within which they operate, but which would readily be made available to a South African authority, both, I would suggest, to the prosecuting authority and to the independent anti-corruption um, uh, unit that or uh, agency that we're, we're looking at. And so we should seek that assistance and tap into those skills and experience on both levels wherever we can. Yes. There's a further point to be made. Th thank you for that, Issa. And that is, in the old days, um, when the Attorney General of the day thought he wasn't, his staff wasn't able or capable of, of dealing with a particular specialized point, members of the bar were briefed. Or well, think of the Milne and early prosecution, or the prosecutions involving uh, Wolf Heller, and there, there are other examples as well. So there's no reason why uh, the members of the bar in South Africa, I'm not saying we mustn't accept international assistance and cooperation, but we mustn't downvalue the, our own bar, which contains a number of very, very capable and competent and able and learned Council, who could be of great assistance on brief in dealing with, with, with the matters of the kind discussed. W one such advocate is one who has covered himself with distinction in the Zondo Commission. And I, uh, uh, I may be embarrassing him, and if so, I apologise. But uh, I won't keep uh, he, I will, uh, won't keep him anonymous. It's it's Paul Pretorius, but he he illustrates the very point that. Uh, the the people who appeared in the before the Zondo Commission were members of the bar, and they did an outstanding job. And I think our country owes a great debt, a great debt of gratitude to them. 
who, Paul, you said you wanted to say something. I'm, I'm sorry if I embarrassed you with that, those comments, but they were, <laughs> they were sincerely meant. Thank you, most appreciated. Very rare, I must tell you. Um, I just wanted to make one point. International crime, local crime, and they are linked. Uh, financial crime are obviously very highly sophisticated uh, operations. And I suspect that we may be still in the era of the deer stalker, magnifying glass, and dusting for fingerprints age. Um, the Zonda Commission had a, a room of highly sophisticated uh, equipment, um, which our law enforcement agencies sadly do not have. Um, basically, the point I'm making is that uh, technological sophistication is vital to any successful investigative effort. Right, thank you very much. That, that is probably a very helpful and interesting note upon which to end. I want to thank the, th the three panelists for all the hard work they did before they came here and for the enlightening and helpful uh, contributions they made to the debates. And also thank those who uh, sent in questions. Um, as I said, some have been used. Those, those that haven't been used, uh, the, the, the questioners can address the questions to the panelists during the break. How long is the break going to be, Paul Hoffman? What <coughs> we are going to do now is take a photograph of everybody in the room, simply come up this end. We'll all stand for the photograph and, and get close together. It should be fun. And then we will break for tea, which is in the staff common room, one floor down on, on the north side of the building. It's better than standing in the sun on the stairs outside where you, you could get baked um, by, by the wind and the, and the weather. So will everybody please just come forward and we will crowd around the front of the room. I'm putting the photographer in charge now. I'm taking a break.